All right, guys, um, we are so excited to have Danielle Cole on this morning. Danielle is another advisor from Facet. And as you all know that we have um, our first partnership with Facet Wealth, and we are um, really pleased with this partnership because we Facet serves clients very similarly to the way we serve clients in our private practice. And what we hope to do with the Wealth That at Wednesday is introduce some of the advisors that are at Facet so that if you know you're listening to them and you feel a connection uh we y'all can email us and we are happy to send out contact information and at the end danielle i'd love for you to um make sure that everybody knows how they can contact you but um today we're we're going to focus on something that i think is really interesting you know we recently did a survey and in that survey we asked um, our members what they wanted to hear about and number one across the board was women wanted to know how they best could grow their wealth. What were some strategies to um, have when looking at your wealth like that? So what we've asked Danielle is she's going to take a few minutes and introduce herself and then we're going to go through some questions and some ideas that she had kind of as it relates to that topic. As women, how can we build wealth? And she'll start um, also talking about some of our options that we have within um, our employee employee or employer employee context, which I think is super helpful. My niece is um, just graduated from law school and is about to start a job. And she came in here last week with her papers and I was like, what do these mean? You know, and I, it's funny. Um, so I think that's gonna be really helpful. So without further ado, and just as quick aside, Lauren is saying goodbye to some people that we have in the office right now and will join us in just a minute. So, Danielle, why don't you start with just telling us a little bit, a bit about yourself. Where are you and what do you do? Hey, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be here as well. Um, I am a certified financial planner at Facet Wealth. <clears throat> um, I grew up near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but I'm currently living in Tulsa, Oklahoma um, with my dog and my two kittens. Um, I have a degree in finance and I went into financial planning right after college. Um, prior to coming to FACET, I was working with high net worth clients, um, but I came here because I wanted to work with more of like everyday people um, that don't normally have access to a financial planner and quality advice. Um, there's a lot of information out there. It can be very daunting. Um, and so when I work with my clients, my role is not just to tell them what to do and give them advice, but also to educate them and kind of take some of the mystery out of the financial planning. Um, <clears throat> also, as a single woman myself, I do know what it's like to be responsible for making all of the financial decisions. And it's nice to have somebody to bounce ideas off of um, and things like that. So my coworkers and I, we use each other as our financial planners to kind of take some of the emotions out of the decision because you know we are subject to those same pitfalls as everyone else. So we lean on each other a lot all of our our women planners there so that's pretty much about um all about me yeah well yeah i know lauren and i um we we definitely love to bounce ideas off each other and i mean that's sort of a big part of the premise of the wealth that it, that as women we really do like to talk about those decisions before we make them like to be able to relate with others who may you know might be making the same decisions and you know in the south and i'm sure it really is universally true but like you know you, you you've been taught that talking about money is um tacky and um we love those relationships and hope that we're going to be able to create even more of that um environment where women feel like they can you know reach out and talk to others about the decision so that's so very important okay so danielle when we had a pre-call you mentioned something that i just think is so important um is the reason why you love what you do is because when women do get control over their finances, it's so empowering as they approach like looking at their future. And you know, we love to say knowledge is power for sure. Um, so what what do you mean, you know, let's talk about what it what you mean when you say like you have your finances in order. 
Um, well, it's very important to just to kind of know what you have. So I, where I would start is to just do an overall review, kind of like a financial inventory. Um, that way, you know exactly what you have, where we say that your finances are controlling you instead of you controlling your finances, where that comes from is being reactive and not proactive. So it's really important to start with kind of like your basic foundation. So that would involve, you know, what is your income? What are your expenses broken out by category? Um, all of your assets, whether it's your home and your car and your jewelry, but also your bank accounts and any investments that you have, as well as any debts and any insurance. Um, you can do it on a notepad, you can use a spreadsheet, just understanding what you have will kind of give you the, the basic point from where you can start from. So once we know that, we can kind of determine how we move forward from there. A lot of these areas intersect um, and affect each other. So once we kind of see it out, um, all together as kind of like a, just a general snapshot, then it can really help decide what's the best direction to move forward. Okay. So you're saying like get an overall snapshot of your financial situation. And then so once you have that, where, where what's the next thing? Is the next place to look and evaluate, you know, with your savings or is it more about the selections that you're making with your employer? Where would you go next? Um, I would start with your basic cash flow. So what do you have left over at the end of the month? And then we can decide where we want to put it. There are so many different types of accounts out there. Some have tax advantages, some don't. Um, but knowing what we have to work with is where we can decide where to put the money. So how much do we put in each place? Um, so once we know that, then we can kind of, kind of put together a basic plan. Um, and then you also get to the fun part. So that's about thinking about all of the things that you want to do, um, because saving for the sake of saving is still a good idea, but we want to always have a goal that we're working toward. <clears throat> so I would encourage you to make a list of all of your goals. And a goal should be defined in terms of time and money. When do you want to do it and how much do you need? And you should include everything, whether it's, you know, I want to take a vacation next year, or I want to do a home remodel in five years, and then also longer term and kind of put together your own timeline. Um, it'll help you get kind of excited and motivated on doing some of those things. And then um, once we know what we need and when we need it, then we can start divvying up um, funds on where to put the money in the right place. Okay. And how do you prioritize like kind of what you want to do over what you need to do? How do you talk to your clients about that? Because sometimes, you know, you're like, okay, I probably should max out my 401k, but I really do need to probably update, you know, my bathroom, you know, in the next three years. Like, how do you think through that with a client? Well, it's very important to, to find the balance between the present and the future. So we don't want to only be saving for retirement and never do anything that you want to do today. Because even a home remodel, um, if you don't plan to sell the home, you still get enjoyment and it is an investment in, in the property itself. So we want to try to find that right balance. And that's kind of where a lot of the planning comes in because we can look at, you know, what, are you, what do you have? What are you projected to have? Because it is possible to save too much. And if you are saving too much, then you could be doing other things in the present that you would not normally be able to do or not think that you can do. Right. Well, and we always talk about this, you know, we have a course called financial minimalism and I see a lot of names that I've recognized um, today that have been a part of that course. And very, you know, a lot of it is, you mentioned just a minute ago, it's about finding your why, you know, like what, what do you want to save and why? And how important that is like mentally, and I know for females, for sure, is like for me, it's easier to say, you know, we're not going to spend that extra $50 on the junk that we might throw in the cart at Target. If I know that we are working towards like, for instance, a vacation budget, we've got spring break coming up, we've planned ahead, we know when we need it, we know how much we need to do it. And I know that by doing, you know, repeated thoughtless spending is going, we're not going to get to meet our goal. So it's easier to meet 
to say no to certain things when we have a good why ahead of us. Um, so I love hearing you say that. Um, okay, so once you've done that, you've worked um, with your client and you've made a list of, you know how much extra you have each at the end of every month, you've kind of worked through your goals and you have a timeline and how much you need. What's next after that? Um, then we have to figure out where to save and how we're going to do it. So there are many different accounts that you can use to build wealth. One of the most common is your employer retirement plan, like a 401k. Um, the huge benefits of that are there are tax advantages. And also if you have an employer match, then let's say that you're contributing 3%, your employer matches 3%, you've just doubled your money just by putting in a small amount out of your paycheck. Um, another way is an IRA. There are different types, a traditional and a Roth. They both offer some sort of tax advantage and there are income limits as to whether or not you can contribute. So you want to make sure that that's the right savings vehicle for you, for you as well. Um, one very often overlooked strategy is a health savings account um, that is tied to your high deductible plan, assuming you have one through your work. Um, so if you have high deductible health insurance, you can contribute to a health savings account and it's tax deductible regardless of how much money you make. Any withdrawals that you use for health expenses are tax free. And what's great about those accounts is that it's almost like having an emergency fund for your medical expenses. And if you've ever had a medical expense, you know that they can be very high very quickly. Um, so for example, if you have a $2,000 hospital bill, you're not scrambling on how you're going to pay for it, or you're not thinking, oh, I was saving for you know, this spring break, or I was saving for this, and now I can't do that because now I have to pay this bill. So if you already have that health savings account, not only do you get the tax benefits, but it can kind of keep you on track that in the event that you do need the funds, you don't have to pull from other accounts or other goals in order to pay, pay the bills. Um, there are also you know, general investment accounts like stock accounts and things like that. Um, there are limited, if any, tax benefits, but you can access the funds at any time. So there are pros and cons of all of these different accounts. Um, those are the most basic places on where you can save, but just as important is how you save. Um, most people, they do want to save more, but sometimes life gets in the way and it's happened to all of us. The car breaks down or the air conditioner isn't working and so on. Um, so if you set up an automatic payment, um, it can help in that it will have you live on what's left. So it can help you prioritize where your spending is and it will also reduce the temptation to overspend and things like that. So that's the strategy that I use with a lot of my clients. Um, if you have a spouse or a significant other, it is very, very important to have the discussion about what you want to accomplish and when. Um, everyone has different goals and priorities. And if you sat down and had the discussion, if you haven't had it so far, you might be really surprised at the answer. Because I know there are times when I've had these conversations um, with clients and I say, well, what is it that you're looking to accomplish? And, you know, one says something and the other person is like, what are you talking about? I've never even heard you mention that. So then I kind of feel like a marriage counselor, <laughs> yeah. um, but you should overall always be having these conversations. And I recommend having a kind of like a financial checkup at least quarterly. I'd recommend also having like little mini monthly meetings, but sit down at least quarterly, talk about, okay, this is what we decided we were going to do because maybe something else has come up. You have a family member that's ill and you need to provide care, you know? So as your situation changes, you can easily adapt because you've already got a plan in place. You just need to make some minor changes. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also encourage you to save as much as possible, but still be realistic about how much you are saving. So kind of decide on the dollar amount, set up the automatic savings, um, and then you're not tempted to kind of like skip a month here or there. If you wait until the end of the month and just save what's left, it's like, oh, well, you know, I really wanna buy this or we wanna do this. And it's just too tempting to just not do it. Mm -hmm. um, and we also want to select an amount that is sustainable over time. If it's too low, 
it's not going, you're not going to make a lot of progress very quickly. But if it's too high, you could overdraw your account on a regular basis, which not only will cost you money in terms of a fee, but also kind of make you frustrated and think, oh, well, I can't do this. It's too hard. And then you just give up. So there are changes that you can make that are small, and then you can just keep increasing or changing those um, strategies and increasing your savings over time. So a strategy that I use a lot with my clients is I kind of time any, um, any kind of big savings or any increase in savings with when they either receive a bonus at work or whenever they get their raises. So if you got a 4% raise, you can increase your savings into your retirement plan by 2%. So you still end up with money in your pocket, but you are still increasing the amount that you're saving. And you didn't really notice it because it's not like you were getting a higher paycheck and now you're getting a lower paycheck. Um, or if you get a bonus, just split it. Say, I'm going to save a certain percentage and then I'm going to use the rest for the vacation or the home remodel or what have you. So you can use the same pot of money for multiple goals. Yeah. So, um, but what I've seen a lot is that once people start saving and they start seeing the accounts grow, um, whether it's in your bank account or your retirement account, you almost develop kind of like a sentimental attachment to that money and you kind of get excited about seeing it. So you start saving more or you don't dip into it for like a frivolous you know, impulse purchase or anything mm -hmm. like that. You know, I've actually seen that work with my child and, you know, I laugh because, you know, as adults, we still are humans, just like our teenagers, you know, but without any boundaries, you know, sometimes I like watch her and I'm like, this is sort of fascinating. Um, but we've, I've been making her save part of, you know, like babysitting money and as in, she was never happy about it. However, now that she's seeing that amount grow within the savings account, it, 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 it has triggered something in her that now that's hers. Like, you know, well, you know, if you can buy that, if you want to, you have enough money in your account. She's like, no, I'm not going to spend it. You know, so there is something that really is psychological about seeing that money grow. And then you kind of become attached because you also realize there's a lot of freedom and peace and knowing that that's there. And for me, it's something that I realized that is more valuable than that thing I want, you know, because when you know that, okay, I can cover it, like a health savings account is a great example of that. For me, like I love, you know, when, I'm, when I've saved for those unexpected expenses, when the unexpected happens, it's not an emotional roller coaster. At least for me. And I, I imagine that a lot of other women are like that. And, it, and maybe not only single women, but I think maybe single women is amplified a little bit because it is just you that's providing that money. So there's something to be said for that. So I love that. Um, one thing I'd like to go back to and talk about a little bit more in depth is um, the concept of having meetings with your spouse. Um, yesterday, when, in one of our financial minimalism courses, we were kind of laughing because, you know, when you are married and you've got, or you have more than one person spending in the household, you often do have different goals. And sometimes I'll hear women and men say in our private practices, it goes both ways, is one spouse spends more than the other, you know, or, you know, one person has, um, more discipline and spending than the other. So how do you counsel your clients when something like that comes up? Um, well, you always have to come to some sort of middle ground, right? So mm -hmm. somebody's got to loosen up the purse strings and then someone also has to be a little bit more mindful of their spending. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> we do that a lot with automatic savings plans. And sometimes we we'll even just set up a separate account. So you know, whatever the income is, we want to make it fair. After all of the bills are paid, then X amount of dollars goes into your account and that's your own spending money. You don't have to explain what you bought. You don't have to explain why you bought it, mm -hmm. um, but it can kind of give a little bit more separation uh, in that. And then you have a little bit more freedom to do the things that you like to do. And if the other person does not want to spend it, they can save it. Um, but it is really important to, also come like you have to agree on the end what is the end game here 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, we can spend a lot of money or we can save everything we want, but then we're not going to enjoy what we're doing currently, or we will be able to, you know, retire early, but, um, you know, not everybody wants to do that, you, you know, so you have to really have the same end goal in mind mm-hmm. and you have to at least agree on that to some extent as to what you're trying to accomplish. And then it's up to the two of you to hold each other accountable for this. Mm -hmm. You said it was okay that you would go on this vacation. So we're going to just use the money to do something fun. And you said it was okay to cut back on this so that we can retire early and not have to worry about running out of money. Mm -hmm. So as long as they can kind of understand that. And when you have those conversations, you have to take the emotion out of it, which is so much easier said than done. Mm -hmm. but you cannot get emotional or upset or blaming or anything like that. And it's very easy to do that when you're in a serious relationship, but you've got to just really focus on this is the plan. This is what we said we're going to do. Are we doing it? And if not, why are we not doing it? What's the reason for it? And sometimes people just don't realize what they're doing or how they're doing it. But if you can do it in a calm and rational manner, it's a much more receptive to that than if you are pointing your finger at them or saying, you know, we're not going to be able to do this because of you. You're like, certainly not productive at all. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just very important to have a calm, rational discussion about that. Yeah. Do you think that it's helpful to have that conversation with your advisor in the room or is it something that you should do prior to seeing your advisor? Um, well, you could do it either way. Some people actually speak more freely in front of me because yeah, that's, that's what we've seen. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so, and I always tell my clients, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to shame you. I have to know what's going on so that I can give you the right advice. Mm-hmm. Um, so some people will actually say things to me, um, with their significant other present that they would not say in a private conversation because they know they're in a, like a no judgment space. Yeah. So, um, but you, sh- they should still be having these conversations behind the scenes as well. Yeah. Okay. Another question in the same vein is, um, and we get this question a lot and I actually get this question a lot from my friends. So, um, if there are, if you, are married and your spouse handles the finances um and you know it's not that you're not involved but that's just what they do um do you they always want to say well i I don't really want to be like fully involved in all our financial things but like what are the top three things that i need to know i get that question a lot like what you know what are the top three things i should be asking about so you know if you said if you and your spouse agree to me, you know, once a month, like what would you say the top three things are to go over once you've gotten those goals established? I would say um, the top three is definitely the financial inventory. Mm -hmm. Um, You have to know what's going on and you have to have a basic understanding of the finances, even if you don't want to do it. And you'll see that a lot. One spouse will handle the finances and one just kind of backs away and just doesn't want to be bothered. Um, But you would absolutely have to know what's going on. What if your spouse is in an accident? Where are the papers? Or what if you need money and they're out of town? Do you know where to even get it, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, depending on how involved you are or not, then you should have a basic understanding of that. Um, Kind of tied into that for number two would be um, you need to know any kind of debts all debts. You can even do that on your own through a credit report. Um, But, you know, sometimes people do hide things from one another, not intentionally or to cause Mm -hmm. problems just because maybe they feel guilty or what have you. But um, I've seen a lot of people who got divorced um, or are widowed or what have you. And they're like, they they had all of this debt and I didn't even know about it. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. So you just want to be staying updated on everything that you have. Um, And then finally, just really, where are all of the documents? So if I need to look at something, where, where can I go? And you should, I always encourage people to at least be part of our meetings on, on occasion, even if they don't want to do it all the time, simply so that they get to know me and they feel comfortable so that if there is any kind of 
you know, question that they have or emergency that they know who to contact that will help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really wise words. That's a great list. And, you know, I do think with an understanding of that, like with the inventory, and as they get more comfortable with it, then better questions come. You know, it happens naturally. I mean, I know I felt like, you know, the, the more I started to dig and like get it, then you were like, oh, well, actually this. And then you find that your curiosity is peaked and then it provides just like that extra push to really start getting more involved. Um, mm -hmm. I know the first time I went with our advisor when, yeah, my husband and I, we were young, but we were first meeting and at first I was like, well, he handles all that. And, but then once I met with him, I was like, well, actually, you know, and I found out I was really more interested than I thought I would be. Um, and then lastly, and because I definitely want to give our listeners um, a chance to ask questions, but another thing is, you know, I have the kind of the beauty of looking back over my relationship. I know a lot of people know that I lost my husband about six years ago. And when I look back at like how we handled our finances, I let him do most of that work because that was sort of the male role and what was supposed to, you know, I don't know, when I was growing up, that was just kind of how it was. And looking back though, I probably think once I did become, become more involved in that, I probably was the better person to handle it. You know, like, and it, that, that's not even negative towards him, but he was really busy um, starting a company and doing all these other things. And I had more time to do it. You know, do you, do you ever, like when you're meeting with couples, help them figure out who's best to take the lead? Um, well, they usually have that kind of predetermined, mostly out of habit, just like you said. This right. is the way we've always done it. Right. But there are a lot of people who were not involved previously that become very involved in mm -hmm. it. And they don't, um, you know, they're not trying to take over or, you know, step on toes, but they will get more involved. They'll ask more questions and then they will... Um, do it together rather than one person doing it and the other person being more passive. Yeah, yeah. And I say that just to all you women out there, if there's somebody that like feels that way maybe, and or maybe it's like, oh, actually I really kind of relate to that as I think about it. I just think if I had heard somebody say that while I was married, I probably would have taken a little bit more like, let me help you. I, I would like to take this, like I want to become more involved. So just to encourage women that are starting to feel that way to, you know, sometimes the spouse might say, absolutely, that would be amazing. Thank you. You know, um, rather than maybe sitting in these, you know, traditional roles, you know, so sometimes you can kind of push on those a little bit. All right. So Danielle has given us an amazing amount of really, really practical information. Thank you so much. I'd love to have any questions. Does it, it you know, you can take your um, speaker off mute and ask questions or use the chat feature. Does anybody have any questions today? Oh yes, yeah, Sarah, what's, what's going on? Unmute. Hi, um, this is my first uh, like chat with y'all. So anyways. Well, we're excited to have you. Thanks, I'm always working during this time and I listen to podcasts and I was like, I could just make this like, okay. um, anyway, so I really appreciated you speaking. I have this, um, uh, positive and negative in my family where my husband um, is a he's a CFA so he's like ex for you know I call him a, an economist um, yeah. <laughs> he's like yeah, he and he's like big grand scheme like I don't know really what he does <laughs> but they handle like institutional money and so because of that like he's my accountant um, and he sucks at that um, <laughs> He also handle, you know, does our family like finances. And I told him the other day, I was like, just because you're in this field doesn't mean that this is necessarily like, you know, maybe we should pay somebody to like micromanage us. Cause he's not, he doesn't micromanage me or him or us. And it's like, anyway, so I guess my question for you is like, what does maybe, maybe I missed the beginning part of this, but what does it look like to meet with you? Um, you know, what does one, how do you get started? Um, what does it cost? Honestly, my husband's such a, he's like, oh, why would I pay somebody when I do this? And I'm like, but you don't do this. You know, this is not at all what you do. So. Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. What a CFA does and what a CFP do are extremely different, right? Yeah. And um, the way I start with my clients is we have kind of like an introductory meeting and we also do um, kind of like a data gathering. So we go through the financial information and also have a goal discussion of what you want to accomplish and when. Um, but, you know, just like I said, I consult with my other, my coworkers, my female coworkers for the same reason that a doctor doesn't operate on themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of like the same concept here. So, um, but, and then we have, you know, several planning meetings and um, it's not only investments. A lot of people think that's what financial planning is. Um, right. It's going all the way from, you know, your estate planning to college planning, debt management. It's all of those areas. And they all intersect a lot of times in one way or another, especially when you start figuring out tax implications and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, I would encourage you to, to talk to somebody and just see, it might be kind of a struggle to get him on board. Mm -hmm. Um, but just because he, he does do it, you know, kind of like we talked about one person usually does the finances, but they just did it because that's how it started. And that's how they've always done it. They may not want the ongoing responsibility of doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just kind of you know, he has to be open to the idea, first of yeah. all. Um, and then we could, you know, maybe talk about getting on board and seeing, kind of explaining what the difference is between the planning and what he does as a CFA. Yeah, I'd love to email you after this. So thank you for that. Yeah. He would be agreeable. I think I'd just like have to initiate it, you know. So. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great question, Sarah. And thank you for, um, Catherine says, thank you for your honesty. We all get it. <laughs> Oh, we definitely do. All right, so we have a couple of questions to the chat feature that I'll throw out real fast. And it, obviously, if you've got, to, if you need to jump off, y'all feel free. But um, I know everybody's interested in everything you have to say, Danielle. So, how often do you usually meet or check in with your clients? Um, after we've gotten all of the initial planning done, um, it's at, you know anywhere from three to six months, depending on what strategies we've implemented, scheduling, and so on and so forth. Um, just we want to make sure that we are on track. The strategies that we put in place are working. Mm -hmm. um, now, if something happens that someone is buying a home or, you know, they've lost their job because of COVID, we would have extra meetings around that. You're not limited to that schedule, but we, we think that's kind of like a, a comfortable medium where, you know, I can update you on any kind of tax law changes and then you can update me on what's going on in your personal or your professional life. So that if we need to make any changes and adapt our strategy that we can do so. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and to just throw out, we also do have a discount offered to our members through um, with FACET. So I can email more information about that to you, Sarah, as well. Um, okay, now Ashley asks, can you elaborate on how to include insurance in your financial inventory? Great question. That is, that's one of the most often overlooked areas um, that people that people have in financial planning. They just sign up for their benefits and then forget all about it. Um, but I would look at what you have in terms of um, health insurance, disability, life insurance, if you have long-term care, and also your property insurance, like your auto and your home insurance. Um, so just look at, you know, what is the benefit and how much are you paying for that? Getting those benefits through work is the most cost-effective way to do it. Um, but even, you know, like your auto policy, you may have gotten something when you were young and you had basic minimums, but as your wealth has grown and your net worth has grown, you may have a very low limit, which means if you're in a car accident, you know, you're now liable for anything above and beyond that. So we would even review something like that because it's good to review a lot of those things about every three to five years. Um, just to make sure that, you know, if you didn't update your life insurance and you had a child, then, you know, we should probably definitely do that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm a big proponent of insurance and, you know, always check your umbrella policy. That's a big one that's often overlooked. And, um, you know, life insurance, definitely reevaluate just the exact same thing as what you were saying. It's like, as you get older. Um, and as your lifestyle changes, that's something that's really important and often overlooked. And, you know, I think that's another question I get from women all the time is like, 
how much life insurance is enough life insurance. And that's something that you can really work through with your planner um, and come up with a number that really does fit the needs of your family, which rather than just kind of making a shot in the dark or, you know, oftentimes I know like in our case, we had, you know, met with an insurance salesperson, like when we had our first baby and then 10 years later, you know, you're just like, well, I guess it's still fine. I don't really know, you know, so it's just, it's something that you can work through though. And it is, it's a math, a math equation. So, um, okay. I love this. Ashley, thank you. She said, I had not even thought about including insurance benefits in my financial management before you mentioned it today. This is super helpful. So Danielle, thank you so much for being here today. This was great. And um, thank y'all everybody for participating and asking wonderful questions. This is what the wealth that it's all about. And it's exciting to see everybody engaging. So thank y'all. And I hope everybody has a great day and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Danielle, do you want to give your email address before we leave? Yes, you can contact me. I'll type it into the chat box here. Um, you can contact me at danielle at facetwealth.com. Um, you can also, um, one of my associates is Andy at facetwealth.com and he can actually get everything set up for you um, and kind of make sure that you're directed to the right place. So, um, but you can contact either one of us and then we could get in touch with you um, and help you get started. And make sure that you say that you're a member of the Wealth Edit because you do get a discount. And if for some reason you lose those email addresses and you need it, you can just reach out to our um, email address at the Wealth Edit and we can give you that information as well. Okay. All right. Thank y'all. Oh, thank you. Week. All right. Bye. Bye.